Hey everybody, I'm Michael Light, and this is my podcast, The Bibleonian. I'm a layman who is absolutely crazy about the Hebrew Bible and about Second Temple Jewish theology. And on this podcast, I'm exploring all of the Hebrew Bible and how it is all completed in the life, death, and resurrection of my Messiah, Jesus. And I also read and write about theology and about other religions that I'm studying. And you can see my raw thoughts on these topics and more by following me on all of my socials. And you can find my more polished works on my website with a link in my show notes. With that said, let's move right into this episode for the week. The plan is to make this the first episode in a multi-part series on the gospel. And throughout this series, I'm not yet sure how many parts it's going to be, we will be diving into the different fundamental aspects of the gospel, such as creation, Jesus, and the purpose of his life, death, and resurrection, and how that all ties together, heaven and earth and their relationship, and hell and what it really means. But before any of that, I think it's important to get out of the way what's not true. And so in this episode, I wanted to specifically explore the flaws with the fundamental flaws that we have with the gospel. And so not just because he's the only person that has misconceptions about the gospel, but because I think that his misconceptions are uh, major and pretty popular, I wanted to take a look at Ray Comfort's videos on how he shares the gospel and how he teaches other people to share the gospel. Now, these videos are, my critique of these videos, that is, are in no way to bash Ray Comfort or throw him to the ground and show him how horrible of a person he is. In fact, the point of this episode is to actually show how we can grow as Christians, not only in how we share the gospel with others, but in how we understand the gospel and how that shapes how we live our lives. So in this episode, I want to go through one of his videos, piece by piece, bit by bit, and everything that he says. And I'll also be bringing up things that he brings up in other videos where he shares the gospel and teaches others to share the gospel and talk about those and discuss the flaws with those. had a kidney transplant a year ago? What would have happened to you if you hadn't had that transplant? Uh, probably wouldn't be here. Do you think there's an afterlife? Where would you have gone? Okay, so stopping this right here. So I do want to commend him on one thing, and that is the transition from talking about everyday life into the gospel. That's awesome. That's amazing. But um, in this video, for example, he's talking to do t- two different people and it's switching between the two conversations that he's having. But in the example of him talking to the lady that he's talking to in the video, which I will link in the show notes to this video, he talks to her and he begins the conversation by saying, do you believe in an afterlife? To give you context, the name of this video is what biblical evangelism looks like. First of all, what does the word biblical mean? If we're talking about biblical, it should be not just things that are taken from the Bible, but things that are directly correlated to the whole of the Bible. We can't just play blackout poetry with the Bible. We can't just take different parts from the Bible that we like and then um, preach or share the gospel based on that. We have to look at the whole storyline of the Bible. And the whole storyline of the Bible, when you open it to page one, it does not focus on the afterlife. Yes, as Christians, we can get information as to what our afterlife will be on page one. But on page one, we see God turning chaos and death and destruction 
into something that's life, into something that he is going to use as an environment to put humans in and that he's going to work with humans in. And so if that's what the story of the Bible is about, is about God working with humans, yes, those humans sin and they fail. If the beginning of the Bible is not about the afterlife, in fact, the afterlife isn't even brought up until much later in the Hebrew Bible, much, much later. Um, The very fact of the intermediate state, which I guess you could consider the afterlife, it depends on whether you're considering resurrection or um, death, but that even that concept isn't brought up until just before the 40th chapter of Genesis. And so if your first question or your first part of explaining the gospel is asking about the afterlife, you have just cut so much out of the story. Not only have you cut out the Abrahamic promise, the deliverance of Israel and God's working with Israel to bring about Jesus, that's understandable because Jesus fulfilled all of that. But what Ray Comfort is going to do is he's essentially going to ask these people where they think they're going to go. And so what is your perception of God if the first question in their sharing of what's supposed to be the story of God is, hey, where do you think you're going to go? Do you think God's going to damn you to eternity, brimstone and fire? Or do you think you're going to float on the clouds with a bunch of naked baby angels handing you an apple? How do you perceive God at that moment? If you pick up the Bible and read the first couple pages of Genesis, the first pages of the Bible, the picture you'll get of God is that he takes forces of death and destruction and chaos and turns them into things that are giving life. He's making an environment suitable to humans and he's upholding it to work with humans. That's what God is doing. And so it's so fundamental that before we jump into the story of how God has worked with humans, we talk about the fact that God wants to work with humans. God went out of his way to make a world specifically so he could work with humans and have them share in all of his goodness. Uh, there's only two places you can go. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell. One of the two. Um, I mean, we either go to hell or heaven. So where are you going? I'm going to heaven. Probably. Again, the speech of going to heaven and going to hell. Consider this and think about the passages that talk about going to heaven. There are very few passages. Very few. There is the one where Paul talks about how he ascended into the third heaven. Well, he technically says he knows somebody, but most scholars presume that it's Paul talking about himself. And yes, Jesus definitely does talk about a a place where we will live with him. And like I said, even Paul's accounting of his story makes us presume that we will be in heaven after our death. But if you think it's only about going to heaven, then you have completely and entirely misinterpreted most of the gospel accounts. When Jesus goes and preaches, a lot of the times, the gospel accounts will summarize his his preaching by saying that he preached, repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's Mark 1, 15. In the book of Matthew, he preaches, I think, close to 40 times within less than 30 chapters that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He, he uses that language. And he's not preaching about us going there, although there is truth that we will enter into that. But he preaches about himself bringing that down into earth. And so what Ray Comfort is telling these people to do is he's telling these people to consider where they're going based on some prayer that they prayed and not 
what they are causing to happen right now. You have any... I think you're a good person. Yeah, I try to be. I try to be a good person. Okay. How many lies have you told in your life? Many lies. Made about 15 to 20%. 20%? <laughs> have you ever stolen something? No. It's not one of those many lies, is it? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I've said oh my before, yeah. It's blasphemy, it's very serious. Yeah. Things aren't looking good, Eric. Oh man. Yeah, Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes, I have. Okay. Hey, this is another example of ripping a passage straight out of its context. If you read the passage where Jesus says that if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery, he says you have not, he does not say that you have committed adultery, but that you have committed adultery of the heart. And that's not to take away or lessen that. In fact, that is even worse. Because the claim that Jesus is making is not, oh, okay, now you have broken one command. And so now because of that, I'm going to punish you to um, burning in this fire that I lit for you. Instead, what he says is that when you lust after a woman, you have just made your heart something that is now inclined to lusting after women. And now that lust is going to lead to you going on and looking at porn or taking the next step, whatever that is, that will eventually lead to looking at porn, then masturbating, then whatever. And it's just going to take you on this trail that gets more and more destructive. Again, Ray Comfort is so focused on heaven and hell being realities that are solely after death. But when Jesus preaches, he preaches that heaven is something that is coming to earth. And when James writes his epistle, for example, he writes that we can create hell by the words that we say. It's good news and bad news. Which would you like first? The bad news first. The bad news is that you've broken three of the Ten Commandments. You're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, blasphemer, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he Okay, so again, you see his low view of sin coming out. A higher view of sin, the true biblical view of sin, is that sin is us causing self-destruction on this earth. It's not just that we broke some laws and so now God has to condemn us to some prison that he made for us. It's that we have brought about death and destruction on this world. And so God is going to send us to deal with the death and destruction that we made on this world. Judges you by the Ten Commandments, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Mm, hard to say. It's not. It's easy. Lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate heart, you'd be guilty like the rest of us. Again, these people see these sins as small sins. And in a sense, they're not necessarily wrong. Not that sin in and of itself is small, but compared to other sins, you could call them, quote-unquote, small sins. In fact, Jesus seems to confirm this by saying that when you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. He's saying it's these small sins that actually deceive us and make us think that we're doing okay and that we can just make it in and we can get better but that will actually get worse and worse and worse. This isn't in any way a lower view of sin. It's actually a higher view of sin. It says that sin in of itself is destructive. God does not need to do anything about our sin other than leave us to deal with it ourselves because dealing with our sin is what hell is all about. Oh boy. Why don't you go to heaven or hell on that basis? Purgatory. There's no purgatory. I've it's like you said at the beginning, heaven or hell. True. Okay. Well, the Bible says if you hate someone, you're a murderer. That's how high God's standards are. And he see? Again, the passages that he's talking about are about God leaving people to deal with their own sin. 
You take the adultery one, for example. Jesus says, it's better for you to gouge out your good eye and to enter into heaven than for you to be cast out into Gehenna with your eye. Again, that's language of God leaving you to deal with your own sin and your own self-destruction. Your whole life and you're under his wrath and if you die in your sins, you'd certainly go to hell. The Bible says all liars have their part in the lake of fire. So does it concern you that if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell? No. You don't care about your life? I mean, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so it does concern you? Yeah, it does. It does. Tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so he wouldn't have to go to hell? God did something wonderful. Do you know what it was? Forgive them. He forgives everyone. I know that pretty much. No, the Bible doesn't say that. Well, God became a human being 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth, who gave his life on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. The Ten Commandments of... Okay. What Ray Comfort just did is he skipped over the entire life ministry of Jesus. Jesus didn't just come and die. Jesus took upon people's sins. It was not in any way that Jesus just had to be there on the cross, taking on the wrath of the Father, and the wrath is just, God is so angry that he just has to kill somebody, but then Jesus jumps in the way. No, that's, that's not what that is. Jesus' death and resurrection must always be viewed not as separate from Jesus' life ministry, but as the epitome of his life ministry. Everything that Jesus is, does in his life ministry, it isn't just about him going around and doing miracles to show, oh, hey, by the way, I'm God. You read in the Gospel of John all over the place, it says he didn't need anybody to think that he was God or tell him he was God because he knew that his, that he bore his own testimony and that the Father confirmed it. He knew who he was. He didn't need anyone to tell him who he was. But if you have this low view of heaven, hell, and sin, then you can't really explain the purpose of Jesus' life ministry other than he was going around and doing cool things. But when you take on the fundamental view that what Jesus was doing was actually taking on the brokenness, the sin, and the destruction and death that we were bringing upon this world onto himself to die with it and come back to life so that we could be a part of that new life, that's something completely different. That's when you start to understand the storyline of the Bible. And again, notice that he brings up Jesus' resurrection almost as if it's an afterthought. Because for him, heaven is something that is after we die. The resurrection is absolutely crucial. For thousands of years, Christians, whenever they explained Jesus' death, they also shared Jesus' resurrection in the same breath. Because not only is it important that we die to our sins, but it's even more important that we became alive in Christ and that we can be a part of this new creation. And Ray Comfort just misses all of that. Well, the moral law, that's what we looked at. You and I broke the law. Jesus came and paid the fine. If you're in court and someone pays the fine, the judge can say Eric's guilty, but someone's paid his fine. Again, the focus is solely on what happens after I die. There's no implications for what they do now. So if I'm being evangelized by Ray Comfort, I can say my prayer and I can say that I believe in Jesus. But why should I even do what Ray Comfort's doing if heaven is only what happens after I die? If it's only about where you go, if you go to the big white fluffy clouds, or if you go burning in brimstone and fire forever. There's no reason. There's nothing compelling about that. Because it's not biblical. He's out of here. And God can dismiss your case, forgive your sins in an instant, and grant you everlasting life as a free gift, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. Just before he died, he cried out, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. Eric, that means God can forgive all those secret sins. Well, pretty much. 
You can wash clean, you can make your righteousness sight in an instant because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay. At the moment, Sonny, you're like someone standing on the edge of a plane, 10,000 feet up. He thinks he's going to save himself by flapping his arms. Okay. It's not going to work. He's got to trust the parachute. At the moment. No. They've already jumped. No, actually, just the, the whole analogy here is velocious. Because you don't get to heaven or hell based on whether you prayed some prayer or whether you did all the rituals. You get to heaven or hell based on the whole trajectory of your life. The sinner's prayer, quote unquote, what's actually placing faith in Jesus is something that will produce works and you will be sanctified throughout your life if you are a true believer and you will become more like Christ and God will be bringing about the kingdom of heaven through you. And so the resurrection won't be something that's completely different from your life on earth. Well, it will in one sense, but in another sense, it will only be a fulfillment of the rest of the life that you've been living since you first placed your life in Jesus. And in the same way, someone who is in hell, who ends up being sent fully to having all of the hell that they have already brought about in the world around them, being sent to that, to deal with that on their own, is them just coming to the fulfillment of all of their wicked actions and death and destruction that they have brought upon the world. It's not entirely separate. It's the climax of everything that they've been doing up until now. You think you can save yourself by being a good person. It's not going to work because you're not a good person. You're like the rest of us. Transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. What you have to do is repent and trust in him. That's not going to be easy because the Bible says we love darkness and we hate the light. We love our sins. We get pleasure out of sin. So you've got to say, God, you've got to please change my heart. Give me a clean heart. Please forgive me. And he'll do that. You'll be born again with a new heart and new desires. You'll pass from death to life. And God will grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Now, do you think I'm telling the truth? Yes. Okay, so if you died today and God gave you justice, you'd end up in hell. There are two things you have to do to be saved, Eric. You must repent and trust in Jesus. When are you going to do that? When I go to church on Sundays. Oh, it's right. Thursday today, you might be dead by Sunday. Oh, man. Really quick, if you're enjoying this video, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post two new encouraging videos every single day. We also have many more resources available on livingwaters.com. Thank you so much. What he just said, but for this podcast. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. So I'm saying, Eric, just in the quietness of your heart, yield your life to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness of sins. Put your trust in Jesus. Transfer your, your trust from yourself to the Savior. And do it today because this because God commands you to. Right. You gonna think about this? Yeah, sure. I think about that. I think about Okay. So compare this even not just with the whole storyline of the Bible. But even just with how Jesus preaches, any time that Jesus preaches, Jesus preaching about lust being the adultery of the heart, he doesn't pray, he doesn't say that you should repent because you could die any time and then you might go to hell instead of heaven. He says because it's causing hell for you right now. And when he preaches about heaven, he preaches, don't just repent because you could go to heaven when you die and you could die any time. He says, repent because heaven is now and you can be a part of it now. The, the, the method that Ray Comfort uses for preaching the gospel is, in all seriousness, this isn't to bash Ray Comfort. It's anti-intellectual. It's anti-biblical. And it's disingenuous to the teachings and the entire storyline of the Bible. It's based on a few Bible verses that have been torn out of context and misinterpreted.
with all that said, I just want to repeat the fact that this podcast episode is not about bashing Ray Comfort or his ministry. This podcast episode is about taking seriously the most fundamental aspect of the Christian life. Not just for the new believer, but for all believers. The gospel is not something we outgrow. The gospel is not something that ever loses its importance. It's the most fundamental aspect of Christianity. And so if there's anything that we have to get right, it's the gospel. Again, the point of even this video was not just to go and say exactly what the gospel is. As we think and rethink the gospel, we have to do it in steps. It's not something that just comes to us all at once. It's something that we should constantly be considering. And so the purpose of this specific episode is to consider our version of the gospel, how we understand the gospel, and the validity of it. This is something we should always constantly be considering and reconsidering. If the gospel is true and it's what we should live our lives based on, then we have to get it right. And no one can ever get it all the way right. But we should definitely be thinking about it to the best of our abilities and striving to understand it in the way that God presents it, in the way that the Bible presents it, and in the way that it really is. With all that being said and done, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. I hope you guys are transformed by this episode and the critiques that I give of this gospel presentation. I hope that these are things that we will all consider deeply as we go throughout, not just our different weeks or days, but throughout the rest of our lives, that we will consider the gospel and the profound effects and implications that it has on our everyday lives. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you guys next time in Babylon.